Welcome back to the MOOC course on Corporate Social Responsibility. My name is Aradhana Malik and I am helping you with this course. And uh, we finished the module on Corporate Governance. I deliberately did not spend any time on Corporate Governance in India. I wanted you to find out for yourselves how Corporate Governance is happening in India. Uh, maybe I'll share those notes with you at a later time. But then, so, uh, you know, I'll just give you the notes. I will not explain these things to you because I've already done that in so many different ways. So that's your homework. You read through the notes. If you have any trouble understanding them, please get back to me on the forum and I will respond. Okay. Now, uh, this module is about uh, sustainability and, uh, you know, corporate social responsibility and sustainability. We have discussed a little bit about sustainability earlier when we were talking about uh, the uh, you know, the socially, uh, social responsibility, our responsibility to the environment. So, but before we really go get into sustainability, what we really need to talk about is corporate citizenship. When we talk about corporate social responsibility, what really connects CSR to sustainability is the idea of corporate citizenship and I told you earlier that we would be covering this in detail so I have a few lectures on this for you in this module this is week 7 so let's see what we have here for you okay CSR and sustainability that is the name of the module and corporate citizenship is the name of the lecture okay what is corporate citizen what is citizenship before we go into corporate citizenship let's talk about what citizenship is citizenship refers to belongingness, it refers to affiliation, it refers to your rights and along with all of this comes a package of responsibilities. I belong, I am an Indian, I am part of this organization, I am an IITN, I am an IITN, I am teaching here. So I have all these rights and, and you know I belong, I have a sense of identity because of this very nice place that I am a part of. However, that also brings a set of responsibilities. So citizenship is, you know, your uh, presence or affiliation to a larger community and everything that comes along with that larger community. Now, uh, a formal understanding of citizenship comes from the statement by Marston in, uh, cited in Matten and Crane's paper published in 2005 and uh, uh, this uh, this statement is legal you know corporate citizen or citizenship refers to legal entities with rights and duties in effect citizens of states within which they operate so we function in a particular environment we function in a particular uh, uh, setting we our identity is a function of the setting we belong to the setting we function in and this is a you know when we talk about citizenship citizenship is a legal entity with rights and duties you belong to a place you function within that place but there are and you have certain rights by virtue of being connected to that place in addition to that we also have some duties some responsibilities something that we need to do in order to maintain this relationship keep it going on so that is what citizenship is all about now on a very broad level rights of citizens can be classified into three different categories social rights civil rights and political rights let's see what these are social rights consist of those rights that provide the individual with the freedom to participate in society such as the right to education the right to good health huh? so all of these are social rights hmm? so right to practice your own religion these are social rights okay so you know the rights that provide the individual with the freedom to participate in society with the freedom to to mix with the society with the freedom to to be a part of the society an active member of the society are called social rights now civil rights consist of those rights that provide freedom from abuses and interference by third parties most notably governments now this is not my statement this is something that madden and crane have written in the paper and i'm just quoting from there among the most important of which are the rights to own property exercise freedom of speech and to engage in free markets so these rights 
uh, refer to freedom from abuse, freedom from discrimination. So these rights consist of those rights that uh, provide freedom from abuses. So they entitle the citizens to to not be abused, to not uh, you know they they entitle their work to not be interfered in by third parties by people who are not directly affected by that work, by their participation in something. So these are civil rights, huh? the rights to own property. You, you can own a house, again there are restrictions, you know, uh, we are talking about now, now I will get into a little bit of uh, legal, uh, uh, not jargon, but legal aspect of this. For example, in India, the right to own uh, agricultural land in some states is restricted only to practicing farmers who are residents of that state. Now, even though you know we have a lot of control at the center, you know any Indian cannot, any other citizen, any non-practicing farmer of a, um, a state cannot go and buy farming property, agricultural property in some states. So, uh, you know that is a law, but that does not mean that you cannot, but again you know some, I mean residential property is routinely advertised for people from all over the country, occasionally even for, for non-resident Indians, for foreigners to, so you know, so it just depends on where you are, there are certain local laws and policies that govern this. But you do have a right to own property. As a citizen of India, you have a right to own property within India. As a foreigner, again, the, the laws of that country are put in action. So, they, they operate and they decide, they determine what you can and cannot own and buy. So, anyway, so exercise to freedom, uh, you know, exercise freedom of speech. Again, freedom of speech as long as it does not disturb others. So, you know, and engage in free markets. So, these are civil rights. Again, I am not a lawyer, but I am, you know, as, as a citizen of the country, I can just tell you very briefly what these rights are, but so that you get an idea. Okay. Political rights. Political rights include the right to vote or the right to hold office and generally speaking, entitled the individual to take part in the process of collective will formation in the public sphere. So, formation of unions, uh, the right to vote, the right to set up a political party, the right to get together and do something collectively for the common good and or generate a collective will. Now that is those are the political rights. So these are the broad categories into which the rights of citizens are classified. Now we come to responsibilities and I will not give you the detail here. I will give you the detail of our responsibilities when we talk about when we connect corporate citizenship to CSR to corporate social responsibility. In the meantime, when you watch this, please start thinking about the responsibilities you have as citizens of the country hmm, to your country. We, we have a lot of, you know, uh, we enjoy a lot of rights, a lot of freedom, a lot of privilege as, as citizens of a, a, um, an amazing country like India, we also have certain responsibilities and that is what this course is all about. We are enjoying these rights, we need to give back to the society that has given us so much. So I want you to start thinking about it if you haven't done so already. Okay. Now the opportunities for corporations to step in as citizens arise in three different scenarios. One where government ceases to administer citizenship rights. So, in a place where the government is no longer administering citizenship rights, society is ridden by social strife, where there is fighting, etc. Where government has not yet administered citizenship rights, these are the developing countries. These are the countries where the government or countries that have just been liberated, you know. So, or uh, countries that have um, um, uh, just been formed where, where the government is just trying to get a hold of its you know, or, or get its bearings, trying to get set up, where it has still not administered citizenship ship rights. And the third situation, this third scenario is where the administration of citizenship rights may be beyond the reach of nation state government. These are primarily social rights. Now, this is where a country like India comes into the picture. 
you know everything else is in place our government is ready to administer the rights they are trying to but a country as complex as india a country as as diverse as india faces a major major problem in terms of uh, you know reach physical reach and social reach we still have areas where it is very difficult to physically reach you know you have to go either on foot or on horseback i mean there are still no roads in some parts of the country though those such places have reduced in number but still or you know you can only reach by boat and so it's very difficult to physically reach people and give them say you know build schools there i recently read that uh, kerala now boasts of being able to give electricity to every home so every home in Cal- in kerala has been has has received electricity kerala is probably the first state to have done that and that is amazing because the, you know we've started that and there was a time when i was growing up there were places that were still not they that still did not have electricity you know so even in my home state we we still we still have some very few villages but we still have some areas where there is no electricity but i mean this is a start so you know this is this is a beginning so 70 years after independence we can say that at least one state has been able to give electricity to all its homes so that's really nice so that's what i'm talking about the a country as physically diverse there are places where you can't reach we have everything we have the himalayas we we have the the oceans we have you know we have, we have deserts we have every physical topography that one can think of and uh, we have all of it in one tiny country i mean as compared to some other countries india is not very huge in size population wise yes and the population then brings in another uh, uh, another complexity we are so diverse culturally i had read somewhere that every 200 kilometers the culture of the people changes the language they speak changes the kind of food they eat changes the kinds of clothes the way they tie their sarees the color of houses changes i mean everything changes so every 200 kilometers you can see a stark difference in culture and uh, that is really that really poses a lot of problems so getting to the people and giving and convincing them that they must send their children to school you know and um, i mean that is and setting up schools in in far flung places where maybe the population density is very very low for example the northeastern states i've had a chance to i visited nagaland and i've seen you know you'll find a few a hamlet here and a hamlet there and and uh, you know it's it's like it's very difficult to get to those places now will you set up a school in a place that has maybe only 2 to 300 people maybe will you set up a school in a place that has only 10 homes a tiny tiny hamlet maybe maybe not you know children could be in, in different age groups so how do the children go or you set up a school where everybody is expected to travel say you know walk on foot uh, maybe 5 or 6 kilometers how will those children get to the school things like that so and many of you listening to these lectures could be living in such areas could have gone through these situations so that's what i'm saying you know the third point really applies to india so the third point really applies to india where the administration of citizenship rights may be beyond the reach of the uh, reach of the nation state government okay now in areas where the government ceases to administer citizenship either corporations have the opportunity or are encouraged to step in where once only governments acted or corporations are already active in the territory concerned and therefore their role becomes more pronounced as governments retreat governments are you know their social strife where um, they they have given up you know the country is fighting the government is still unstable they have stopped administering rights so what do the corporations do they have the opportunity to step in where only once where once only governments acted so they say you know the government banks on people who have the resources to step in and help out the other is corporations are already active in the territory concerned and therefore their role becomes more pronounced they've already been helping governments and their role becomes more pronounced they are they are uh, they they are uh, banked on to deliver more than they were delivering earlier so they are already involved with the community and they are asked to participate even more okay 
what is corporate citizenship now we were talking about why corporate citizenship now we are going to move into really what is corporate citizenship corporate citizenship describes the role of the corporation in administering citizenship rights for individuals so you know it is it is the corporations the profit making organizations taking their resources and helping governments to helping governments to administer citizenship rights to their citizens okay how can the corporation help corporate the uh, corporate citizenship uh, deals with the social role of the corporation in administering citizenship rights so they can help administer social rights by treating the corporation you know the corporation can be a provider of social rights they can facilitate social rights they can enable the civil rights they can they can help with the civil rights and what are the civil rights let's just go and revisit this so they give social rights they set up schools they do uh, you know they they set up hospitals they give social rights then they enable civil rights civil rights consist of those rights that provide freedom from abuses and interference by third parties among which the most important of which are rights to own property exercise freedom of speech and engage in free markets so they help with the administration of civil rights they 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 facilitate they set up situations where uh, citizens have access to civil rights or they can exercise their civil rights and the third is the political rights where the corporation acts as a channel so they allow the formation of unions in their uh, within the um, their boundaries and they allow these unions to get together and they become a channel for for people to get together so this is how the corporation can help okay now when we go to global corporate citizenship we are talking about different organizations from the same industry from different parts of the world coming together to help with social rights of people connected to that industry we've talked about one of these organizations in the past i'll show you a couple more the first one here is the fair labor association let me just show this to you okay so here is the fair labor association hmm? improving the lives uh, improving workers lives worldwide let me just increase the size so you can read a little bit the website address is fairlabor.org so you can see this yourself okay so some organizations different organizations from different parts of the world get together and work exclusively on improving the lives of their workers worldwide okay home here hmm? since 1999 fla has helped improve the lives of millions of workers around the world so you know they've they've um, uh, fla creates lasting solutions to abusive labor practices by offering tools and resources to companies delivering training to factory workers and management conducting due diligence through independent assessments and advocating for greater accountability and transparency from companies manufacturers factories and others involved in global supply chains so you can go through this website they very nice to see what they are doing they deal with you know several issues fair compensation fire safety etc so you know they are they are they are getting together and they are dealing with issues they they invite organizations to be a part of the association and then together they are building a network of professionals of organizations that are helping improve the lives of workers all over the world irrespective of the government regulations irrespective of the culture within i'm not saying irrespective i'm sorry it's you know within the confines and and boundaries of the local laws and in um, um, consonance with the local culture they are helping improve the lives of workers all over the world the next uh, website or the next uh, organization that i want to tell you about is the equator principles hmm. equator principles is a risk management framework adopted by financial institutions primarily banks for determining assessing and managing environmental and social risk in projects so banks have got together and they get together and they try and follow these principles equator principles were launched in 2003 you can read the details here 
this is the, the website address is www.equator-principles.com. So, you can go through it and uh, see what they are doing. Another organization that we have talked about in the past is Goodweave, you know, which was initially set up as Rugmark to ensure or they uh, a stamp of drug mark or now good weave uh, tells the buyers that no child labor has been used to produce these carpets. So and um, yeah, an offshoot of the old drug mark is drug mark India. So if you are interested you can also go through this website and uh, Mrs. Menika Gandhi is the chairperson of this, this foundation and she is helping with this initiative and it is primarily to prevent child labor especially in the weaving industry. So, if you buy a carpet that has the rug mark stamp on it, it means that no child labor has been used in the production of this carpet. It was the work was done by adults and children were not used for this. So, you know these are great initiatives, these are initiatives where organizations have come together to improve or to give something back to the society. Okay. Now, some dimensions of corporate citizenship. Hmm. Now, uh, a citizenship co a concept, how is citizenship defined? The first dimension is citizenship concept. How is citizenship defined? How comprehensive is it? Now, this is from a paper or uh, from a report by Marvis and Guggins that was published in 2006. And um, uh, this is a working paper and you know they, they are getting together and they are trying to list how corporate citizenship should happen. So, the first dimension here is citizenship concept, what is citizenship, how do we define it, how comprehensive is it, how inclusive a company regards its role in society, do they feel connected, do they feel responsible, do they want, do they, do they feel it is their job to give back to society or not and how well the total actions of a company minimize harm, maximize benefit, are accountable and responsible to stakeholders and support financial results. And you know, so the profit making aspect is an important part of, of CSR okay, and of corporate citizenship also. All right. The second dimension that they talk about is strategic intent. What is the purpose of this citizenship that organizations engage in. Is citizenship embedded in a company's strategies, products and services, culture and ways of doing business or is it a, is it still being imposed on them? Are they still toying with the idea? Has it been integrated? The third dimension that they, they talk about is leadership. Do top leaders support citizenship? Do they really lead the effort? Do they walk the talk? Do, or do, the, do they really do what they are expecting their, their staff to do. Then the fourth dimension is structure, how are responsibilities for citizenship managed. So, the movement of citizenship from a marginal position to its management as a mainstream business activity, what are they doing, how are they implementing corporate citizenship movement from functional islands to cross functional teams to integration through a combination of structures, processes and systems. So, where I mean which stage are they in? We will talk about the stages of corporate citizenship in the next class, but these are the parameters on which they are really trying to see where organizations stand. Then issues management, how does a company deal with issues that arise? How proactive is a company on myriad citizenship issues and how responsive it is in terms of policies, programs and performance? How does an organization respond to the organization, to the issues that come up from the environment, from the society that it is in? Then the sixth dimension that they talk about is stakeholder relationships. How does a company engage its stakeholders? So, increasing openness and depth of such relationships. So, you know how does it connect with the stakeholders? It could range from increased social activism by shareholders to an increase in non-government organizations worldwide. So, you know I mean where are they in terms of engaging with the stakeholders? How connected are they with the stakeholders? Then the last dimension that Mavis and Guggins talk about is transparency. How open is a corporation about its financial, social and environmental performance? 
where are they disclosing this information how much are they disclosing where are they adopting transparent practices you know how much do they want people to know about you know how much are they putting in black and white about the kind of work they do so all of this is uh, is really being uh, i mean that these are some of the dimensions on which uh, uh, corporate citizenship can be evaluated in organizations. Now, in the next class, we will uh, talk about uh, the stages of corporate citizenship, how do they go from one point to another and what are the different stages in this whole connection of the organization with the society that it is a or with the social milieu that it, it, it functions in. So, uh, thank you very much for listening to this class. Look forward to uh, talking more about this in the next lecture. Thank you.